Hey everyone, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, welcome to our A-level physics session today on practical skills. Uh, so today is going to be kind of an interesting one because practical skills are something that are going to be coming up um, all across um, your A-level physics course and not in just one particular area. Um, so this is a really important set of skills to be learning about. Um, so just let me know uh, that you can hear me in the chat and all that and just say hi. Um, throughout the session, um, I'll be stopping at various points and asking various questions. Um, it's super useful if you're able to reply, if you if you have any I guesses of the answer or anything like that. Helps me to see if you're all understanding the things I'm saying. Um, and yeah, I hope this is all really useful for you. We'll just uh, we'll just leave things a minute or so to give people a chance to come into the session. Well done to everyone who's uh, made it out, especially if you're in the UK like me. So that we uh, four p.m. on a Sunday. That's a really good effort. Uh, so congrats. Okay, so I think we'll I think we'll pretty much get started straight away and let people fill it in. So, like I said, today is about practical skills. So this could come up in all different parts of your A level physics course. Um, just a bit about us and a bit about me. So this is coming from Snap Revise, uh, and I am Matt. I'm head of physics here at Snap Revise. Um, and that's one of the things I do. Some of the other stuff I'm doing is I'm a PhD student at Oxford University and have been an A-level physics tutor, so teaching this kind of content for the last four years or so. Now, just a reminder, if you're confused at any point as well, at any of the stuff that I introduce, uh, just let me know. Just, just type something in the chat to show that you're confused, ask a question, and if we have time, then we'll try and talk through it and clear it up. Okay, so... Thanks very much, everyone, for coming, and let's let's get started. So I said today was about practical skills, uh, and we got three main objectives, three things we want to learn about practical skills, if you like. So experimental skills is another way of thinking of this. So the first thing is kind of the theory of experiment. So we're going to try and understand the terminology used for scientific experiments and measurements. So we're going to talk about things like precision and accuracy, random error, systematic error, those kinds of concepts. And then we'll do some more practical things. We'll understand how to calculate certain important quantities from graphs. The classic one being the gradient. The gradient is so often useful in experimental calculations. And... The third thing we'll do is learn how to handle uncertainties mathematically. So often you have two things that you're uncertain in and you need to multiply them together and you need to actually calculate how uncertain you are of the new thing you got from multiplying them together. So the kind of mathematics of uncertainties, that's the third thing we're going to go through. Uh, now, the good thing about today is you don't need to know much about A-level physics yet to understand what we're talking about today. Pretty much the only thing you probably really need to know is some stuff about units and prefixes. So we're just going to revise that stuff now before we get going with the main session, uh, just to get us all up to speed and kind of just to get us all warmed up, really. OK, so um, I've got two massive tables here with a load of symbols. And just to get us started, this uh, this symbol here on the left hand side with an M, you may well be aware represents the unit of meters and meters are a measurement of length okay so following this similar pattern feel free to pop down in the chat what any of these other symbols on the left hand table here represents so for instance i'll i'll, I'll go through as well but feel free to put any in that you recognize so s here represents seconds And that is a unit of time. OK. So what about kilograms? 
Aha, uh -huh. yeah, we've got moles at the bottom. Absolutely right. That one's a really nice one because it looks so similar to the symbol we used. And what is what are moles a measure of? They're kind of a funny one. They're a measure of literally the number of molecules in something. So number of molecules. Nice. Okay, any others? What else have we got here? So kilograms should be pretty familiar. Kelvin temperature. Nice. Good. So K stands for Kelvin, and that's a measure of temperature. We won't come across all of these today. In fact, I can't completely remember which ones we'll see, but we'll see quite a lot of them. Okay, so we've got A and KG left. Nice stuff. Kilogram weight. Nice. Good stuff. This is the kilogram. And so I would actually be slightly careful. Weight, just as a reminder, is a kind of force. It's the kind of force that you have as a result of having mass in a kind of gravitational field. The actual thing that kilogram is a measure of is mass. Good. And then ampere, absolutely right. Good. Ampere is a measure of, well, it's actually current. So you have Coulomb, which is for charge, and then current is like charge per time or rate of flow of charge. And that is the, that is measured in amperes. Okay, so that's great. That's all the units sorted. On the right-hand side, uh, we've got all the prefixes. So these are things that you can put in front of all of the units to express a load of factors of 10 in a really neat way. Yeah, nice. Ampere is current. Perfect. Okay, so... I'll just mention what some of these are. Again, feel free to kind of chase me and write down any of the ones that you recognize. So maybe the ones at the extremes are actually the least recognizable. There's terra here, which means you have times 10 to the power 12. There's giga here, which means times 10 to the power 9. You might mention, recognize these from like gigabyte or terabyte. Nice. Okay, really good. Then we've got mega. Yes, so good. Okay, yeah, nice. We've got mega times 10 to the 6. Kilo, or kilo, which is times 10 to the power 3. Let's see. Nice. I think we've actually got them all now. Let's see. Ah, we haven't seen milli. So there's milli, which is times 10 to the power minus 3. Micro, I saw in the chat and that's times 10 to the minus 6. It's really good to have these in your head. I think, depending on your exam board, a lot of these will be in your formula book, but it is pretty good idea to roughly have an idea of them in your head anyway. So pico times 10 to the minus 12, and femto times 10 to the minus 15. Okay, great. I saw them all. Except for maybe Pico, actually. But there you go. Good. Okay, so that's just a kind of warm-up. And the reason why we care about units and prefixes so much in this is we use them to say things about quantities that we've measured. And today it is all about various skills in dealing with measurements and analyzing measurements. Uh, so there are many exam boards. For the three main exam boards, we're actually going to put up here the spec points that we're going through in your syllabus, so you can compare this. Uh, so here's the AQA spec points, here's the OCR spec points, and here, for reference, if you want to scroll back at any point, is are the Edexcel spec points. Aha, uh -huh. yeah. So there are deci and centi that I I. I see them more often used only for length, but you're absolutely right. There are many others. There, there are many other names for many other things, but um, kind of the most important ones to remember, there are ones which are steps of three away from zero. So 10 to the three, 10 to the six, 10 to the nine. But you're right. There are loads of others. That's true. Okay. So we're going to start by talking about some experimental terminology, as promised. And maybe the first thing to think about is you've all picked pretty much to do A-level physics, which, it, which means you've chosen essentially to do some science. And there are essentially two nicely interacting parts of science. There's kind of theory and experiment. 
Um, and it's worth thinking about what the purpose of a scientific experiment is here. So in science, often we propose theories about how we think the world works. Usually they're mathematical theories. We then perform experiments to test those theories. So I propose a model. I might say, I think there's this thing called force and it's going to be equal to mass cubed times acceleration. You could go out and suitably defined, you'd find out that that prediction was false. That was a bad theory. You could test it with experiment and it would turn out to be wrong. F equals MA would turn to be right. Um, but there is another thing that we use experiments for as well, which is when we've kind of accepted a theory, we often use experiments just to measure quantities. We might just literally want to know how much mass there is in the earth, how large the sun is, or maybe even how much a, gra a grain of sand weighs. So one of the other things we use experiments for is to measure physical quantities. Okay. Now, especially in the first case, but in both of these, there's this kind of separation between two types of variables that we deal with in an experiment. There are independent variables and dependent variables. Can anyone tell me what the ind what it means to be an independent variable in an experiment. I will give you a hint maybe by saying what the dependent variables are. The dependent variables are the variables which we measure in our experiment. There's another type of variable we care about in experiments, and these are the independent variables. So there are the things that we're going to measure. Those things are actually going to depend on the things we call independent variables. Aha, so that is going to be the third one at the bottom. Yeah, good. So <laughs> the variables that you keep the same, those are the control variables. We'll come to them in a second. But the independent variables are the things that we actually change to see some effect. So these are the variables we change to see some effect. OK. No worries. Yeah, absolutely right. And control variables are variables we keep constant. So maybe it's probably worth thinking about an example here. So variables we keep constant. Okay, so let's think about an example. Let's think about an experiment where I am hanging some kind of a mass. Let's draw ourselves a mass here. I'm hanging some kind of a mass off of let's say some kind of a spring. So here we go. I could want to find out the relationship between how much mass I load on the spring and how long the spring gets. So there are a few things I could measure. I could vary, for instance, the amount of mass that I hang off the spring. That would be kind of independent. I could then, as a result, measure what the new length of my spring is going to be. That would be the kind of dependent variable here. I'm trying to figure out what happens to length when I change the mass. Then control variables would be, I mean, there are so many control variables. You can't even in principle keep track of them all, but you try and figure out what you think the main things are that you need to keep constant. So something key here, for example, a key control variable here would be something like the temperature. I would want to make sure that the temperature doesn't change as I'm varying my other things. Otherwise, it could be that the length of the spring only changed because the temperature changed and not because the mass changed. OK, so here I would want to meet, make temperature a control variable, something that I try and keep constant throughout the experiment. OK, really nice. So that's, that's about the kinds of variables in experiments. And after we've measured them, we want to know how good our measurements of them are.
So, okay, there are two kind of criteria for like goodness of a measurement. There's precision. We want our measurements to be precise and we want them to be accurate. And these words for us are going to mean different things. So can anyone say what it means for a measurement to be precise? Yeah, really nice. Yeah, good. Precision is a measure of how close together our measurements are. So if our measurements don't vary much, from each one to the next, then we can say that our measurement must be very precise. We're not varying around too much. Okay, good. So what about accurate then? Accurate is something different. It's about how close we are to something in particular. So I'm going to actually start jotting it down, but feel free to race me to it. Good, how close you are to the true value. Accuracy of a measurement is how close a measurement is is to the true value accuracy can be harder to determine than precision actually really good when values are close to the true value so as an example let's say that i did a few measurements of let's say i've got a piece of string and I'm trying to measure how long it is. What's its length? Okay, if I did a load of measurements, if someone did a load of measurements and they got four meters, five meters, and six meters as their measurements, and someone else did a load of measurements and they got three meters, five meters, seven meters, the first set of measurements would be more precise than the second measure of measurements because the first set of measurements are all closer together. Okay. However, let's imagine that the string was actually 20 meters long. Let's say that is actually how long it was. And let's say instead that the second set of measurements was still as imprecise before, it was still as spread out, but instead we had results like 10 meters, 20 meters, and let's say even 40 meters, or let's say 30 meters or something. Okay, the first set of measurements would be more precise. They're all closer together, but they wouldn't necessarily be more accurate. It would actually seem like the second set of results were more accurate. Each of them was actually closer to the real value of 20 meters. So the second set of measurements here is accurate and the first set of measurements is precise. And those are different things. Good. Okay. Very nice. And now we're going to mention two other things, definitions of random and systematic errors. And we'll just jot these down. So a random error is a single measurement. It's essentially a mistake. It's a single measurement which does not match the pattern of the other results, or let's say of does not match the true pattern. Okay, good. Typically a random error could be due to some kind of isolated fault. It could be that I literally misread my ruler when I, me when I measured the length of the piece of string. It's unlikely to happen, but occasionally it will happen and that's a random error. Then there's a systematic error and that's kind of a different thing. So a systematic error is a property of a set of measurements. So it's a set of measurements. You only know it's systematic if you have a load of them. A systematic error is a set of measurements which all math 
all miss the true value due to a consistent fault. Yeah, so often it's caused by some kind of faulty instrument. So here's kind of a funny, almost a silly example. Imagine I had a ruler, but the ruler didn't start at zero. On one end, it started at three, three centimeters or three meters rather than zero meters. Okay, let's say three centimeters. Then all the measurements I would get would be wrong by an additional three centimeters. And that would be a systematic error. Okay, the good thing about systematic errors is often you can spot them when you process your results and remove them again. Okay, so yeah, typically it could be it's some consistent fault in an instrument is the kind of thing that causes a systematic error. Good. Okay. So now let's talk about graphing results. So we need to talk about how we can plot a line of best fit. And we need to remind ourselves how to calculate gradients afterwards. So let's say we've collected a load of results. Here are my results on the right hand side here. And I've got these dots and they represent the actual value that I measured. And I've got these bars which represent my uncertainty, both in whatever my X variable is and whatever my Y variable is. Okay. Now, if we want to plot a line of best fit and the examiner has given us these error bars, these ranges in the y and x axis, then we should draw a line which passes through all error bars. Okay. So that means that we should try and get our line. It doesn't have to go through every single point. Usually that's not possible, but unless your results are perfect, but it should at least be within the range drawn out for each of these dots. You are allowed to miss what look like random errors. So here you might notice that this point doesn't really match the trend of the others. So that's probably a random error that we can ignore. Okay, good. So we can imagine trying to draw a line here. Okay, now it's going to be a bit difficult for me to draw a nice straight line here, but I'll do my best. And the important thing to spot about this line is that hopefully if I draw it good enough, and that was not a great line of best fit, it looks like it's a bit high, but the important thing about this line of best fit is it at least gets roughly inside each of the sets of error bars. Now, I think I will actually try and draw a slightly better one because that was a bit too high. So let's try again. There we go. That looks much better. Okay, so see that this line goes in between all of the error bars. Now, once you've drawn a line like this, you typically want to calculate the gradient. Now, just as a reminder, the gradient is equal to the change in y over the change in x. So I could calculate the gradient by choosing two points. So I'm going to propose a method now, and I want you to tell me what's wrong with it. I could calculate the gradient by choosing these two points on my line of best fit, calculating this change in y here, calculating this change in x here, and then saying the gradient is change in y over change in x. What is wrong with my method? It's certainly a way of calculating what seems to be the gradient of this line. But why is it a bit of a dodgy method? How could I improve my calculation? Yeah, really good. This is a really short range. If you like, it's a really, yeah, they're too close together. If you want to get the best value possible, it's a good idea to choose points which are very, very, very far apart. That removes the chance of you introducing essentially another random error by making a mistake in your calculation. Okay, so we should typically choose two points which are far apart. Far apart. 
Okay, fantastic. Really well done. So how are we feeling? Just top a just pop a one, two, or three in the chat to let me know if this is making sense or if you're feeling confused. One. Okay, that's nice. Sweet. And just let me know if there's any questions. Okay, two. The good news is, by the way, uh, at the end of each section, we have a couple of exam questions to go through to, to kind of solidify things in our heads. All right, well, let me know if there's any questions. In the meantime, I have questions for you. <clears throat> so in an experiment to determine the acceleration of freefall, a metal cylinder is dropped from rest down a glass tube. Now, whenever you have a kind of big complex question like this, it's worth just kind of almost scribbling on the diagram as you read it. In determine the acceleration of freefall, a metal cylinder. Ah, there's the cylinder. Okay, it's this block here, fine. Down a glass tube. Okay, so they haven't labeled it, but I guess these other lines represent our glass tube. Nice. A light gate, okay, we see that there, is positioned close to the outside of the glass tube. The light gate measures the time taken for the cylinder to pass through it. This time t is used to calculate the velocity of the, of the cylinder at distance s from the top of the tube. Okay, so the cylinder is going to fall a distance s, and then the light gate is going to measure the time it takes for the cylinder to pass through. So that means the time taken to go from being on one side of the light gate to the other. It's going to measure this time interval here. Okay. The student varies the position of the light gate and records t for different values of s. So you move the light gate further down, the time it takes for the block to go through will be different. Okay. Suggest what the student should do to obtain accurate values for t. Okay. There are many, many reasonable answers here. I'll just put in a couple um, to give you an idea. Repeat the experiment a number of times. Yes, this will help us get accurate values because it will help us to notice if we had an example that was actually a random error. If you have, if your first measurement was actually due to, was actually including some random error, then you've got a problem. It's definitely not going to be accurate. It's going to be far away from the right value. But if you do a load of measurements, you can spot the random error, remove it, and as a result, get an average which is closer to the true value. So yeah, the absolute classic is do many measurements of t for each s and take the average after removing random errors okay so that's plenty good enough to answer this question just some other point that you can make a kind of notable measurement um we're talking about accuracy here one other way you could kind of mess up this experiment yeah so increasing the distance usually if you scale up everything in your experiment that increases your chance of doing things more accurately i really like that that would be another good answer record an experiment using a camera and observe what time it falls um because they say kind of accurate but there's something in the wording in the question here that thinks that makes me think that we shouldn't change the kinds of objects that we use to do the measurement. So I'm not sure. You honestly, with these, often it's it's any reasonable answer will be okay. The camera one, I'm not so sure about, just because it's not actually the kind of apparatus they've told us they're using here. If they said something, uh, just to make this clear. If they had said, suggest how the student could change the experiment to make it more accurate, to do more accurate readings, then something like this camera idea, um, I, I think would be more likely to get a mark. Here, there's, there's some sense I'm getting from the question that they only want me to temper sizes and things like that. 
Yeah, nice. Okay, light gate is being used to measure time. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing I'll just mention, uh, it's kind of a silly one in a way, but just make sure the cylinders drop from rest. Um, like it's very easy. I'm sure you've heard about this many times. Um, to accidentally give something a push rather than letting go of it. So when you're letting go of the cylinder at the top, if you accidentally gave it a push, that would make the thing move too fast. You get the wrong value of T later. So making sure that you really drop this thing from rest would be another way to say something that gets a mark. Hey, I hope it's going well. Okay, let's do one more. To determine G, the student uses the following equation. I think this is quite a difficult question. Okay, so we have v squared equals u squared plus 2as. You may recognize this from Suva. No, no worries at all. We're actually about to start a second half of the session, so it should be quite easy to jump in in a few minutes' time as well, if this seems a bit kind of uh, confusing right now. Okay, use the student's graph to show a value, to find a value for g. Okay, so let's take a look at what's on the graph here. In the interest of time, I'm basically going to move us through this question quite quickly. So they've plotted v squared against s. Okay, so it's like their v squared is a y-axis, their s is an x-axis. Let's go back to this equation they've written. They've said v squared equals u squared plus 2as. They want us to find g. g is an acceleration, so it's probably something to do with finding this acceleration here. I'm just going to write this in an either way. I'm going to say v squared equals 2as plus u squared. And this might look a bit funny, but the key to this question would be to notice that actually this looks like a straight line graph because they've plotted v squared as their y. They've plotted s as their x. So this is like y equals 2ax plus u squared, or in other words, y equals mx plus c. So what this equation tells us, just going back now, is that if you plot v squared, which they did, against the distance s, then the gradient will be two lots of the acceleration. And that is the same as two lots of g. So the key here is to say that two times acceleration, and that thing is gravitation acceleration, is equal to the gradient. And then we'll divide the gradient by two. So first of all, what's the gradient? Well, we have some options for where we should measure this from. Um, I will choose some convenient points. This here is at a height of 13.4, and it's along by 0.7 on the x-axis. And then let's choose another point. I think maybe this point here, which is at 0 0.1 on the x-axis and at 2 on the y-axis. So here's the triangle that I'm going to use to find my gradient. Apologies for the very wobbly line. And if I look at this change in y over change in x, what I'm going to get is a change in y of 13.4 minus 2 over a change in x of, whoops, let's draw that change in x properly, of 0 0.7 minus 0 0.1. Chuck that in a calculator and you'll get around 19. And that's good news because that means the acceleration we find, or g, will be 19 over 2, which is, in fact, 9.5. And we know, as they mention in the next question, that g is usually taken to be 9.81. So our answer is not too far away, it's probably correct. Notice they agree, the actual value is less than 9.81. We're asked to suggest why. And I'll just mention here, you may be thinking about this at the moment, why would they have found the acceleration in experiment to be smaller than theory? Well, a classic example is because there are extra resistive forces. So for example, air resistance or friction are slowing our cylinder down, causing it to accelerate less than our calculations say. Good. Okay, really nice. So that was mainly conceptual. Now we're gonna talk about some of the pure kind of mathematics of calculating uncertainties. Okay, and this is something I actually get asked about quite a lot when I'm doing web classes on the Stat Revised website. So, Let's start with a definition of absolute uncertainty. This is a measure of how confident you are in a measurement result. So absolute uncertainty is the amount 
above or below that we think the true value could take. And this will really make more sense when we look at literally a mathematical example. And we'll do that in just one second. Let's say you know the absolute uncertainty. So you could have something like, I know some measurement to be five meters plus or minus 0 0.2 meters. That's saying the amount above or below that the true value could be from five, my result is it's going to be 0 0.2 meters either side. So I think the true value is between 4.8 and 5.2. Sometimes we care more about percentage uncertainty, which is the absolute uncertainty. Divided by the actual value and then multiplied by 100. So we'll take a look at an example of calculating each of these things. Let's imagine that we have used a ruler and we've used it to measure some length of 0 0.1 millimeters to the nearest centimeter. Now, if someone tells you they know something to the nearest centimeter, that means that they know that the, that the measurement they've made is anywhere between, in this case, 0 0.1 millimeters minus half a centimeter and 0 0.1 millimeters plus half a centimeter. Now it's a bit weird because we're working with different units here. So let's try and convert this. Well, 11 meters is 0 0.11 meters, sorry, is 11 centimeters. So they know that this result is 11 centimeters plus or minus 0 0.5 centimeters. That's what the sentence to the nearest centimeter means. Okay, good. Now let's have a go at calculating percentage uncertainty. And when you calculate percentage uncertainty, you want to make sure you have the same units both times. Then we take the uncertainty, which is 0.5. We divide by the value, which is 11. And then we multiply by 100. You check that in a calculator for this case in particular, and you would get 4.5%. And we'd sometimes bother to write this and say the length is 11 centimeters plus or minus, and rather than putting 0.5 centimeters, we could put plus or minus 4.5%. They mean the same thing. Okay, so that's about the uncertainty of a single measurement, but often we have formulas that we want to use, and we'll have to combine measured values. So we'll have to add sometimes or multiply, and let's start with adding. When adding or subtracting two measured values, what do we need to do to their uncertainties? We need to add their uncertainties. Uncertainties together. And again, it will be best if we take a look at some kind of an example here. So let's imagine we have two resistors which are in series. R1, R2. And we measure the resistance of each one separately and we're a bit uncertain about their resistance. And then we put them in series and we wanna know the effective resistance of the two of them in series. We know what formula we want to use. The effective resistance of these two resistors should be the sum. It should be resistance one plus resistance two. So we can calculate that. It'll be 12 plus 5.5. In other words, it will be 17.5. But the problem we have is dealing with the uncertainties. We know it was 12 plus or minus 1. It was 5.5 .5 plus or minus 0.5. But our result is 17.5 17 plus or minus something. And then we look at the rule. The rule says when you add measured values together, you add their uncertainties. So here the uncertainty is going to be the 1 from the first measurement plus the 0.5 from the other one. 1 plus 0 0.5. Okay, and that's all the names. So altogether, it's 17.5 plus or minus 1.5 ohms. Okay, now 
we're going to come to maybe the slightly harder to remember type of calculation, which is where rather than adding quantities together, we need to multiply them together. So does anyone know what I need to do to the uncertainties when I multiply two quantities together? So for example, I could have the speed of a wave. It has, I want, it has a wavelength of this much. It has a frequency of this much. Both are uncertain. The speed is going to be V equals F lambda. But how on earth do I calculate the uncertainty? Does anyone know? I'll do the calculation without the uncertainty in the meantime. But what do I need to do to this two micrometers and this 0.5 kilohertz to get a new uncertainty when I multiply these things together? Nice. Yeah, really good. It's easy to fix. It's easy to forget that and think you just need to multiply them or something. When you added quantities, you added the uncertainties. It might make sense that when you multiply, you multiply the uncertainties, but that is not true. What is true is what's in the comment there, which is when you multiply quantities, you add the percentage uncertainties. Yeah, good. We still add, but this time we add the percentages, not the absolute values. So we're multiplying or dividing two measured values we need to add their percentage values. Percentage values together. Okay, so now we're in a position to have a go at this example properly. So maybe first of all, we can just do the normal calculation. We have a wavelength, which is 198 micrometers so it's 198 times 10 to the minus six meters hi there hope it's going well and then we have the wavelength oh sorry that was the wavelength and then we have the frequency which is 84 that's kilohertz so that's times 10 to the power of three so you can chuck all of that into a calculator and you'll get around 16.6 .6 meters per second 16.6 .6 meters per second but now we have to find the uncertainty, and you're right, it's the fractional, which is kind of the same up to a factor of 100 as a percentage uncertainty, which you then add. So let's calculate the percentage uncertainty in the frequency. So the percentage uncertainty for the frequency is going to be equal to the actual uncertainty, which is 2 micrometers. Oh, sorry, no, 0.5. 0 0.5 kilohertz the actual value was 84 kilohertz don't have to worry about units because they both have the same units and then times 100 if you chuck that in a calculator you'll get 0 0.6 percent so that's the percentage uncertainty for frequency and then we need to do the same thing percentage uncertainty for the wavelength this time it will be the value of the wavelength which is two micrometers sorry, the uncertainty, which is two, divided by the value, which is 98, 198, then multiplied by 100. Chuck that into a calculator and you'll get around 1.01%. Okay, fantastic. So altogether then, we know that actual uncertainty is the sum of these two things. So the total is plus or minus 1.61%. That's what you get when you add these together. So our final answer is V equals 16.6 .6 plus or minus 1.61%. And that's meters per second. And if you wanted to change that to an absolute value, all you'd need to do is find 1.61% of 16.6. .6. Okay, so hopefully this is making sense. How are we feeling? Just check in and let me know how that's sounding. Why are they added? Aha. Uh -huh. So I I couldn't say off the top of my head exactly why it is we need to add them when we multiply. But in terms of when we add quantities together, let's go back to the example we had here. Okay, so to see why this rule is working, and hopefully this will be 
enough explanation. Let's think about the minimum value the resistance could have been. It could have been 12 minus 1, so it could have been 11, added to 5.5 .5 minus 0 0.5. So the smallest you could have had would have been 16. That's the smallest. The biggest you could have had is what? Well, the biggest value of the first resistance would have been 13, and the biggest value of the small resistance would have been six, of the other resistance would be six, and altogether that would be 19. So we know our answer is 17.5, and we know it's somewhere between 19 and 16. And that's exactly 17 plus or minus 1.5. So the point is, it's like the smallest value would come from getting your actual value and taking away all the uncertainties. And then the biggest value would come from your actual value and then adding all the possible uncertainties. So in either case, you're adding or subtracting the sum of all the uncertainties you had to start with. So that's some intuition about why this rule is used. The reason why the percentage rule is good for multiplication is something that I can't answer off the top of my head, I'm afraid. Hopefully that helps. Um, once upon a time in my degree, we did some maths to justify it, but it's, it's something I don't remember now. Okay. So, Let's have a go at some questions. A student measures the acceleration of a drinks can as it rolls down a ramp. He wants to use this acceleration to find the value for G. To find the acceleration, he measures the time T it takes for the can to roll a distance S down the ramp. He uses a meter rule to mark a distance S equals 1.000 meters on the ramp. Okay. Estimate the percentage uncertainty in their measurement. Okay, good. So what can we say? Well, we know that when we use a meter rule, we get some result. We get this length and it's going to be 1.000 meters and then plus or minus some uncertainty. We'll think of what the absolute uncertainty is and then we'll convert that into a percentage uncertainty. Okay, good. So let's think about it like this. They've said that they have used the meter rule. Now let's think about how a meter rule is set up. The meter rule is set up so that it shows you intervals of 0 0.001 meters. In other words, it shows you each millimeter. If you look at a meter rule at home now, you'll find that it shows you each millimeter. Okay, so that means that when we find a result, we're going to find, we're going to have measured our result to be in between, well, how would say this? We will know that our result is somewhere in between 1.0005 and so what is that that is our entire meter plus half of this interval or it's going to be half of the interval the other way so you take half of your how do i want to say this sorry so the intervals are 0 0.001 meters and then you know that you could be let's draw this in here if your intervals are 0 0.01 meters apart from each other, 0 0.001 meters, then when you pick a value, say this one here, you know that you're anywhere between here or here, which is indeed a width of 0 0.001. Good, absolutely right. So that means we're plus or minus 0 0.0005 meters. Good. That's how we'll get that entire range of 0 0.001. Okay, good. Now you would like to calculate the percentage uncertainty here. And the percentage uncertainty here is given by taking the actual uncertainty, dividing by the value, and then multiplying by 100. 
you check that in a calculator and you'll get 0.05%. Good. He uses a stopwatch to measure T. State one technique he can use to reduce the uncertainty in this measurement. Okay, so any ideas of how we can reduce the uncertainty? Well, one of the classics, one of the classic answers that we can give almost all the time is that we can take repeat readings. Take repeat readings. When we measure T. So do the experiment many times, find the average. Okay. Now, here is here's here is here is a chance to practice the stuff that we've seen in the second half, where we combine a load of uncertain quantities together in a formula. So the student determines the mean value for t, and we don't really need to think about the physics of this here, as being 1.2 seconds with an uncertainty of 0 0.1 seconds. So let's write that here. Time is 1.2 seconds plus or minus 0 0.1 seconds. He assumes the acceleration is given by this following formula. Okay, and you might recognize this from SUVA. A equals 2s over t squared. They say, first of all, use the value to calculate the acceleration of the cap. So first we're just doing a calculation. And next, they're going to ask us to calculate uncertainty. So this bit of the question doesn't care yet about uncertainty. So for this part i, we just have to use the formula. S, we figured out on the previous, well, we were told in the previous part, the question was just one meter. So we have two times one divided by the time squared. The time is 1.2, so 1.2 squared. You can chuck that into a calculator and you'll just get a single one value, no uncertainty yet. And that value, My apologies, I'm actually just missing that value here. There we go, yeah, 1.39. 1.39 meters per second squared. Okay, good. Now we're asked to estimate the overall percentage uncertainty in our calculation. And here's a chance to use the stuff we've learned. We know A equals 2S over T squared. That is the same as 2 times s and we're going to worry about the two later so two times s over t times t and we when we draw the formula like this something becomes apparent apparent we have a few uncertain qualities and we're multiplying and dividing them together and that just means we have to add their percentage uncertainties together so the percentage uncertainty of s over t times t is equal to the percentage uncertainty in S plus the percentage uncertainty in T plus the percentage uncertainty in T again. So we were told that the percentage uncertainty in S, well, we figured that out in the previous part, it was 0.05%. The percentage uncertainty in T we haven't calculated yet, but we can. The percentage uncertainty in T is equal to 0 0.1 divided by 1.2 multiplied by 100. That's absolute divided by the value times 100. Put that in a calculator, you'll get 8.33%. So we have the percentage of uncertainty of T, 8.33%. But it's come up twice. There's two factors of T, so we've got to add it in twice. So you put all of that together. And then the last thing you're going to want to do is notice that the that when you multiply some quantity, so any quantity you like, if you multiply it by some number, you also have to multiply the uncertainty by the same number. So the percentage uncertainty in two, sorry, two lots of S over T times T is simply going to be two lots of all of this stuff which you can then chuck into a calculator. And if you chuck all that into a calculator, you should get around 33.42%. So just as a summary there, because if this, if this is the first time you've seen this, it might seem quite a lot. 
whenever you multiply or divide any quantities together, you add their percentage uncertainties. So here we calculated the percentage uncertainty of S, the percentage uncertainty of T, added those percentage uncertainties together, and then just multiplied everything by the factor of two at the end. Okay, so let me know if there are any questions about that. You should now be able to understand the terminology used for scientific experiments and measurements. So what did we see? We saw precision, uh, accuracy, we saw uh, independent variables and dependent variables and control variables. We looked at how to calculate variables using values, sorry, using graphs, typically using the gradient. In some other experiments, you might end up using that area. And then we calculated uncertainties of derived results from measurements. So in particular, we learned how to put uncertainties into a formula, such as one where things are multiplied together to find new uncertainties. Okay, so hopefully that's all making sense. Um, let me know if you have any questions for me. Um, just while you're typing in any questions that you have, um, I'm going to let you know a bit more about uh, where this is coming from. So this is coming from Snap Revise. Uh, I'm just going to let you know a bit about some of the stuff that we're doing, not on YouTube, but on our actual website. Um, but yeah, I'm keeping an eye on the chat. So let me know if there are any questions. Okay. Okay, so I still have my eye on the chat, so just let me know. Uh, yeah, in the meantime, I'm here on the Snap Revise website, and I'm lucky enough to have a few uh, courses running at the moment. Yeah, thanks very much for coming. Cheers. Uh, so I'm lucky enough to have a few courses for myself here, uh, and I'm lucky enough to have the physics courses running on here. So I just want to show you a bit about what we're doing here. and. The idea on Snap Revise uh, with our courses is, is essentially it's a set of video courses. So rather than a textbook as such, the kind of first thing that you'll see is a load of video content that teaches you uh, the various parts of your syllabus. Um, but it's not just set out like a textbook, like a series of videos. Um, the key thing that we're kind of working with here is we're using quizzes uh, to do a kind of smart learning thing where we figure out what it is that you're already understanding well and what you're not working well with in terms of a series of quizzes and that will highlight to you the bits of the course the bits of the video course that you actually need to be focusing the most of your time on so the idea here is to try and do our revision in a way that helps us to revise more efficiently so we either get more revision done or we don't have to spend as long revising either is good so here i'm going to do one of these diagnostic quizzes that's going to then design the course around me um yeah i might be able to share my screen back in just a second so i'll just go through this and then go from there okay question so here i've got a load of questions to go through i'm not going to try to actually answer them correctly we're just going to kind of zoom through them. The ray of a planar wave, let's try and do this one, is, let's see, parallel to the wavefront, sorry, perpendicular to the wavefront. Yeah, that's the one. Okay, so I thought it would be a good idea to get one or two correct. And so I'm just going through here, imagining I'm doing the diagnostic test, because I want you to see the course that we have on the other side. Outside of the video courses, we're also doing web classes uh, where I do sessions like this. Okay. And I've actually chosen one of the longer ones. Uh, let's see, are there any other questions? Uh, with the uncertainties, just while I'm going through this, um, do you have a kind of specific question about them? So here we are, we're almost done with our questions. So how did I do? Okay, so I got 25%. There's some things I know, and there's a load of things from this quiz that I don't seem to know. And then I just want you to see what we have on the other side. 
So here's our video course. And the key thing here is the course is kind of highlighted around what you need to be spending your time doing if you wanna be efficient. So for example, this first video here on the left is highlighted in orange. That means that there's something in here I need to do. So that's already useful. But actually, if you click on the video, there's an entire timeline of the things that I do and don't need to spend my time on. So here I could do of seeing the introduction to Wavefronts again, but I may not need to watch once we reach play in a Wavefronts because I actually got that question correct. Okay, so the whole course is designed like this. And as opposed to just the kind of teaching part as well, we also have the kind of exercises part of a textbook. So we have designed some exam questions ourselves and we've shown how we would answer, how we would actually think about answering them and taking you through the steps that we would take. Outside of that, we've written exam packs where we come up with a load of potential exam style questions for you to have a look at. You can have a go and then take a look at the solutions. And we have our revision guides that you can take a look through as well. Okay, so you can learn either by doing on paper or doing with text, reading text, or doing questions and learning through video, and the course is designed around you. So I hope it would be really nice if we see some of you there. Um, in the meantime, thanks very much everyone for coming. Uh, no, they are not free to use. Um, hopefully there should be someone in the chat. Uh, I think there may be more information about that, but I don't know the pricing off the top of my head, but you will be able to find that on the Satrevise website. Uh, in terms of these YouTube sessions, we are doing these, um, well, I'm doing the physics ones once a month, but I believe each week there is some kind of science one. Uh, but yeah, totally check out the Snap Revise website if you're interested in that. Okay, so let me just go back to where we are. Now, actually, because I'm running web classes at the moment, I pretty much have to go now. So I won't be able to stay on here now and show you much of these calculations, but this is all recorded now on YouTube. So you'll be able to go back in your own time uh, and take a look at any of these calculations. Yeah, I hope I see some of you at Snap Revise and some of you at the next uh, YouTube session. So thanks very much for the really active chat. It really helped me to see uh, how the session was going. And yeah, see you all next time. Bye.